Ephesians chapter 2. If you went to Philippians, you went too far. If you're in Galatians, you're not far enough. All right? It's right in the middle of Galatians and Philippians. Ephesians chapter 2 tonight. And if you don't have a Bible but you want to follow along, grab one of those Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. And if you didn't bring a Bible tonight, you can take that one home. That's yours. Go for it. But we're going to be in Ephesians chapter number two. And the theme for our conference this year is in his image. Everybody say in his image. And I think that this is such a timely and needed topic to talk about identity and purpose. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight. But I want to look to Ephesians chapter number two. And if you don't have a Bible or you haven't found it yet, we're going to put the verses up on the screen. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter two, and we're going to start reading in verse number one. The Bible says this in verse number one of Ephesians. It says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, it's wrong desires in our life, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us, hath brought us back to life together with Christ. By grace are ye saved and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus." that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them." Let's pray tonight and we'll jump into the message. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to open up your word tonight. God, I pray that you would bless our time together, that you would remove distractions. God, that you would fill me with your spirit, that you would speak to me and through me tonight. And Lord, that we would all hear from you. I pray that none of us would leave the room tonight the same as when we showed up. God, I pray that you would have your will and your way and that you would speak clearly to us tonight through your word and that you'd accomplish exactly what you want to. God, remove distractions. Help us to have open ears, open minds, and open hearts, ready to receive what you have for us. God, we love you. We ask that you bless our time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Bryson, could you bring that shovel up here? How many of you guys have ever dug a hole with a shovel before? All right, we got some hard workers in here tonight. That's what I'm talking about. I brought a shovel tonight. This is my shovel. I'm very proud of it. All right, this is a little uh, spade shovel. It's good for, for digging. You can see it's dirty. It's been used. Now, uh, a few years ago, uh, in 2020, you guys all remember 2020? COVID happened, school shut down. We did homework and school online, right? It was a crazy year. But in 2020, a lot of people, uh, they had a lot of time on their hands and they spent a lot of time specifically at home in their house. And people took up all these different home improvement projects. And my wife, Julie, and I, we did the same thing. Uh, we didn't really like the way our backyard uh, was currently constructed. We were recently moved into our house. So we decided we're going to do a, a, a project in our backyard, and we're going to build a fence. We're going to build a fence. Now, I had a job when I was in high school uh, where I worked at the Dakota County Fairgrounds, and I was a maintenance worker, and I helped build a horse arena so I helped dig holes, I helped set posts for the fence, and I'm not going to brag tonight, but it was a pretty good fence, all right? It was, it was pretty good. The horses could not get out, okay, if that tells you anything about how good my fence was. So I had a little experience constructing a fence, uh, not, not much, but I know one of the first things that you have to do when you're building a fence is you have to dig holes for the post. Now, being new into our house, having just moved from our apartment, uh, in there. I didn't have a lot of tools and I didn't have a shovel 
and I was kind of trying to save money and go the easy route and, and not buy an expensive, really nice, like the Chevy and the Chrysler or the Ferrari of shovels. I went more like the Honda Civic route, and I got this right here. This was the shovel that I bought. Now, I don't know if you can tell by looking at it, but this is more of like a gardening tool than it is a shovel used to dig holes for a fence. And my wife, Julie, she could tell you tonight, it was comical watching me out there for hours and hours on my hands and knees with this tiny shovel, digging into the ground, sweating, so frustrated. And it was much more difficult than it should have been because I had the wrong tool for the job. You see, this dinky little shovel, it wasn't designed to dig holes in hard, stony ground for a fence post. It was designed to be used in soft soil in a garden, all right? If I would have had the right tool for the job, it would have been a lot easier. But instead, I broke my back and I worked so hard and I was so tired and worn out because I was using this tool for the wrong purpose. You know, culture tonight and the world tonight has a lot to say about the topic of identity and about purpose. But what I want us to understand tonight is that it's really not their area to talk about. They have no business talking about, cult culture has no business talking about our purpose or our identity. And I love the theme of our conference tonight. It's in his image because Genesis 127 tells us from the creation account, from the beginning of time, it says this. So God created man in his own image. Of God created him male and female created he them. So tonight, with that in mind, looking at the focus and talking about the subject of identity and purpose, I want to bring a message called Built for This. Built for This. And as we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we're going to see three facts from this passage about our identity. All right? If you're taking notes, three facts tonight about our identity. The first fact is this. The first fact is this. Number one, you were worth saving. You were worth saving. Look at verse number one. We're going to read some of these verses. We're going to go back and we're going to look at our passage a lot tonight. So stay there in Ephesians chapter two. It says this, and you hath he quickened. That word quickened, it's a biblical word for he resurrected you. He brought you back to life. What was once dead in sin, Jesus and God through salvation has brought life again, brought hope. And you, Paul's reminding the church at Ephesus, these Christians, that's who the book of Ephesians was written to, the church. He's reminding them, you were once dead in your sins. Look back down. Look at verse number three. He said, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened, there's that word again, hath brought us back to life, given us a second chance, given us a new beginning together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and he hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You see, every single one of us are alike in the fact that we all had a problem. We all had the same problem tonight, and that was sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What is the glory of God? It's talking about God's perfection. God has a perfect standard for anyone to enter heaven, and none of us meet that standard. We all fall short. We all sin. We all mess up. We're all imperfect. But what Paul is reminding the church at Ephesus and what he's reminding us tonight of is even though you were dead, Jesus saw you dead in your sins and he came to the earth, lived a perfect life as the son of God in human flesh and gave his life on a cross for you. Why? Because you were worth it to him because he loved you so much that he couldn't sit on his throne in heaven and watch idly by while you suffered and struggled through this life in your sin, knowing that there was an eternity in hell at the end of the road if he didn't do anything. So he stepped in 
and he took on our guilt. He took on our shame. He took on our sin and imperfection and he took it to the cross on his shoulders and he gave his life to be the perfect blood sacrifice for you and I. And this passage tonight tells us this truth and reminds us tonight, and maybe you've never heard it this way, but I want you to understand tonight, you were worth it to Jesus. You were worth all the pain You were worth him being mistreated. You were worth him being hated and rejected, despised, crucified on a criminal's cross. You see, Jesus had done nothing wrong. He was literally perfect because he wasn't just a man. He wasn't just a good teacher like some people choose to believe. He was God in the flesh. He was the son of God. And in order for us to achieve that perfect standard and have a home in heaven and a restored relationship in God and be bought back from the power of sin in our lives, we needed a perfect sacrifice. And that's why Jesus came. And tonight, what I want you to understand is that you, no matter how imperfect you are, no matter what you're struggling with right now, no matter what sin you're dealing with tonight, right now, that your parents don't know about, that that your, your friends don't know about, that you struggle even admitting that you're in right now, that sin, that temptation, that battle, Jesus died for you because of that. And you were worth it to him. You were worth it all. He didn't second guess. He loved you so much that he gave his life for you. You were worth it to him. I love what Philippians 2 says. It says this in verse 7 and 8. It says, talking about Jesus, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, you might have missed it for a second, but this verse is incredible. This is reminding us and telling us that Jesus, God, the Son of God, came to earth and took on the form of his creation. The creator became his creation. He took on humility because you were worth it. Because he loved you so much. He wanted to save you. He wanted to restore you. He wanted to spend eternity with you in heaven. You were worth it to him. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 goes on to say, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was made rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Jesus chose humility. Jesus chose betrayal. Jesus chose pain and suffering for you because you were worth it to him. He gave his life to you. He gave his life for you because he loved you. Jesus left his throne in heaven and came to earth to be mistreated, to be hated, to be beaten and abused because you were worth it tonight. And I don't know what insecurities you might struggle with. I don't know what feelings of doubt you might struggle with tonight, what fear, what anxiety, what pain that you've experienced in life, but I want you to know and understand tonight that you are loved and that you are worth it to Jesus. And if you ever question or struggle about your self-worth, look at the cross. Jesus showed us everything that we need to know about how valuable we were by giving his life as a payment and as a sacrifice for us to buy us back from sin, to buy us back from evil, to take us from an eternity in hell and give us an eternity and a home in heaven. You were worth it tonight. That's the first fact that we see in our passage. But this brings us to the second fact, number two. The second fact is this. You are wanted. You are wanted by God. Look at verse number eight in our passage. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift. Everybody say gift. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, God in heaven saw us in our sin. And Jesus decided we were worth it to come to earth and give his life on the cross. That shows us tonight that God wanted 
a restored relationship with you. God wants a personal, close, real, authentic relationship with you tonight. And no, I'm not just talking about the person you're sitting next to. I'm not just talking about the person sitting behind you or in front of you. I'm talking about every single one of you tonight. And yes, we're broken. And yes, we're imperfect. That's the point. We cannot do it on our own. That's why Jesus stepped in and did it for us. It's not of works, Paul writes in verse 9. You can't brag about earning your way to heaven because it was a gift. Jesus earned it for you tonight. Why? Why would Jesus do all of that work? And why would he gift us salvation and redemption and forgiveness and a home in heaven? Because you were worth it to him. And because he wanted a relationship with you. If God wasn't really concerned and didn't really desire closeness in a relationship with you and a restored relationship with you, he would have made a list of rules and regulations and achievements and accomplishments that you had to check off in order to earn your way to heaven. He would have made you work for it. He would have made it difficult on you, but he didn't do that. He gave his life. He died on a cross. He suffered shame. He suffered torment for you. He made it easy. He made it simple. The Bible says that it's it's so simple that even a child can understand it. Salvation is not complicated. It's not something that you work for or achieve. It is a gift. It's It's by God's grace through faith that we accept it. When a gift is offered to you, there's not a list of requirements that come with it. Yeah, you have to accomplish these things in order for this to be yours. No, a gift is extended to you and it is accepted in order to become yours. And the same is true with salvation. All of the work that was needed for forgiveness, for a home in heaven, for a relationship with God was done by Jesus on the cross. And then three days later, he rose again and he proved that he truly was the son of God, that he truly was the Messiah, that he truly could overcome sin and death like he had claimed and gave us victory. You were worth it to Jesus. And tonight, I want you to know that you are wanted by Jesus. He wants a relationship with you. Let that set in for a moment. The God of the universe who created everything Walk outside today. You look at the mountains. You look at the snow up there. You look at the clouds in the sky. Consider the seven, eight billion people that are on planet Earth right now. The billions of people that have lived and died throughout history. Jesus took all of the sin of all mankind, of all history, on his shoulders, on the cross, because we were worth it to him and because he wanted a relationship with you. Our God is a personal God. He's God who loves you, who desires to be with you. And I love what the Bible says in James chapter four, verse eight. It says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You see, God's not up in heaven saying, come get on my level. He's saying, just take a step and I'll take a step towards you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. And I don't know what you're going through tonight or what pain you might be feeling or what you're carrying with you tonight. I don't know what your home situation might look like and what you're dealing with outside of these doors, but I want you to know that God wanted you. And he does want you tonight. And you can accept him and you can step into a relationship with him and you can have restored purpose in your life. You can find your identity in the one place that it was meant to be found, a relationship with God, your heavenly father. And that comes by grace through faith in Jesus. See, God doesn't make salvation difficult. He makes it simple. He doesn't ask you to earn it because you're wanted in this family. It's where you were meant to be. You know, it's a beautiful thing in life to be wanted, to be accepted. I think we could all relate to uh, the feeling of rejection. It's not a good one. It hurts. It's painful. But when you step into an environment where you are wanted and you're accepted, 
people are happy to see you and people love you and care about you and have your best interest in mind, it's a good feeling. You know, my son, Mav, he's about a year and a half old. And I love coming home from the end of a, a long day at work and walking through the garage door into our kitchen. And usually when I get home, it's about 5.30 and my wife, Julie, is feeding Mav dinner in his high chair and his high chair is right in front of the door when I walk in. And I love opening that garage door and almost every single time I open it and Mav's staring right at me. He says, daddy. And he's so excited. His face lights up. He's been waiting to see me all day. He wants to be with me. He wants to be close to me. He wants to spend that time with me. Can I tell you tonight? God wants to be close to you. God wants to have a relationship with you. So much so that he gave his life. So much so that he didn't wait for you to come to him. He came to you. You are wanted tonight. I don't know who has rejected you, who has hurt you, who has broken your heart, who has left in your life, who has let you down. I don't know all the pain that you maybe have felt and experienced in your life, but I do know this. There's a God in heaven who saw you in your sin and knew that you were worth it and loved you so much, and he wants a relationship with you tonight. He's just waiting for you to take that step to him. He's waiting for you to accept him into your heart, to believe on him today. You were worth it to Jesus. You are wanted by God. And the third and final fact that we see tonight in our passage is this. You have purpose on your life. You have purpose on your life. Look at our last verse tonight in Ephesians chapter 2. It's verse number 10. It says this. For we are his workmanship. Everybody say workmanship. Now this is a Bible word, okay? Workmanship. This is the Greek word in the original language, poema. Everybody say poema. It's kind of fun to say. It rolls right off the tongue. And this word, uh, it refers to something that was created, something that was made, or a work of art. So think about this for a moment. Paul is reminding the church at Ephesus, he's reminding us tonight through the Holy Spirit. He says, for we, the church, the followers of Jesus, we are his, God's workmanship. When God looks at you, he sees a work of art. He sees his masterpiece. He sees the jewel of all creation. You see, in all the beautiful things that God made, the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the oceans, all the incredible things, the, great, the Grand Canyon, the things that take our breath away in their beauty and in their majesty, God put his label of favorite on you and I, on humanity. God didn't create anything in the world, any animal, any plant, any item. He didn't create anything in his form and in his image, but you and I. That's the only thing in creation. You can look back at it. Through all the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest, God put his stamp of approval and his image on one thing and one thing alone, humanity. You carry the image of God. Imago Dei is the way that it's said in Latin. It means the image of God. We are the only part of creation that bears this name, that bears the image of God. And that should mean something to us tonight. That should give you a sense of purpose. That should give you your sense of identity. It's not found in a relationship. Your purpose and your identity is not found in another person. It's not found in this world or the culture's idea of success. It's not found in a sexual relationship or identity. It's not found in anything like that. It's not found in a job title. It's not found in an amount of followers or an amount of influence or your or the world's idea of success. Your identity and your purpose comes from one place, one source, one alone. And it's God, your heavenly father. He created you. He put a stamp of approval on you. He said, you are good. He said, you are created in my image. You are worth it. You are worth me giving my life. 
You are wanted and you have purpose on your life. You are not here living and breathing tonight by mistake. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. God has purpose for your life. You have purpose on your life. You have value on your life. You were worth it to Jesus. You are wanted in a relationship with God. And he and he alone can tell you what your true identity is. He and he alone can give you your purpose tonight. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Very simply, what this passage of scripture is saying is that your purpose, my purpose, every single one of us tonight, our identity and our purpose is found in knowing God deeper and making him known to others. That is where your purpose is found. Not in anywhere else. You cannot find fulfillment in anything else. It will always leave you wanting more. It will leave you disappointed. But fulfillment, purpose, identity is found in your creator, in your heavenly father. I want to encourage you tonight and remind you that God made you on purpose and for a purpose. In the world, culture, the devil is actively fighting against this today trying to sow confusion and distortion and perversion in every single area of our life. But I want to remind us tonight that you are a boy on purpose. God made you the way you are on purpose. You are a girl tonight on purpose, not by mistake. You're not one thing trapped in another's body. God created you as what you are on purpose. Now, what this does not give us is this does not give us the license to sin and to follow our wrong desires. Paul addressed that in the first seven verses. He said, we were once giving into our fleshly desires. We were once giving into the desires of our mind, right? And he was condemning this. He was reminding them of their sinful previous life before Jesus, before salvation, before accepting him and following him and stepping into that relationship with God. So just because we have a natural desire does not mean that that is okay and that's how God wants me to be. If our natural desires go against what God says in his word, we are what needs to change, not God's word. So if I have a sinful or wrong desire in my life or a struggle in my life, I cannot in good conscience say, well, this is how God made me and I'm okay with that. I need to fall in alignment with God's word and not my own. I need to say, hey, I might want this, and this might make sense to me, but if it doesn't line up with scripture, I don't care how much that might offend me, how much that might offend culture. I'm going to stand on the truth of God's word because my feelings change, my opinions change, the world changes, but God and his word never change. You have purpose on your life, purpose giving, given to you by your heavenly father, your creator tonight. Don't let culture hijack these terms, hijack these things and get you confused and going in the wrong direction. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and anchor your life in the truth of God's word because he created you on purpose and for a purpose. Tonight, I want us to understand that this life that you're living, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. It's not about wealth or success or popularity. It's not about how much you can acquire in this life. It's all about knowing Jesus deeper and making him known wider. That's the purpose that we've been given. To make known and show forth his praises, like Peter said in that verse. To show forth his praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light to know God deeper, and then to make him known. The purpose for your life, very simply, is to grow closer to Jesus, become more like him, then to help those that don't know him come to know him themselves. 
That is the purpose for your life. Your identity is not found in anything that this world can offer. Your identity is found in your creator and your purpose is fulfilled when you're living in according to God's word and when you're bringing others to him tonight. Maybe tonight you've been missing your purpose. Maybe you've been making a lot of the wrong decisions and you've been focused on what you want to do and you've been focused on this or that, your desires that you've gotten your eyes off of Jesus, you've gotten your eyes off of what God says in his word. Maybe tonight you need to take a moment and you need to recalibrate, you need to gain perspective and simply submit yourself to God. Say, God, I've been, I've been striving, I've been working, I've been pulling, I've been going in all these different directions, but God, I haven't had my eyes and my heart fixed on you. Tonight, God, I want your purpose for my life, not my own. God, I want what you have for me and not what I want for my life because I'm trusting, God, that you know what's best, that your way and your will is greater tonight. You see, every single one of us were created and built on purpose and for a purpose, not by mistake. But just like I was killing myself, digging those holes with that tiny little shovel, using a tool that was created for a specific purpose, I was using it for the wrong purpose, to try to accomplish something that it was never meant to do. And I wasted so much time doing it that way. Don't let that be said about your life tonight. You were created with a purpose to know God and to make him known. So don't waste your life. Don't waste any more time tonight living for yourself, living for the world, pursuing what you want, pursuing wrong desires. Tonight, take this moment. Don't move past it. Don't push it on down the road. Don't procrastinate. Tonight, make that decision to trust Jesus and his will and determine that God's purpose for your life is going to be your purpose for your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed tonight.